In this episode, I'm headed to the Danish island of Lolland for a visit to Frederiksdal. There, I sit down with Harold Krabbe to chat about sour cherries. Harold took his sprawling 18th century farm from wheat, barley, and sugar beets to berries and barrels. Using traditional and new processes, Frederiksdal has created something truly unique. A brilliant cherry wine that is sweet yet sour, and a drink you should seek out. Welcome to No Pants During the Pandemic. Hi, I'm Kevin Brooks, and this is No Pants During the Pandemic. Today is part one of a very special interview I'll be having with Harold Krabbe from Frederiksdal Kirsbergen in Denmark. Frederiksdal is a winery, but they're not using grapes to make their wine. They use sour cherries grown on their own farm to produce this truly unique and wonderful beverage. So without any further ado, let's speak to Harold. Hey Harold, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. The pleasure's all mine. Um, Why don't we just jump right in and uh, why don't you tell the nice folks on the interweb uh, who you are? I'm Harold Krabbe from uh, Frederiksdal Cherry Wine here in um, two hours south of Copenhagen. Normally I ask how people get into, you know, what they're doing, but um, for you, kind of, I guess the story of you getting into cherry wine begins with the Frederiksdal estate. Can Can you tell me a little bit about it? I live in a house from 1756. It was built originally. But the estate actually goes back to the 1300s, I think. Yeah. Where we're situated is actually in a very, you could say, strategic point. We're quite close to Germany. And from way back to the Vikings, year 800, the population came up from Southern Europe and they were moving up north. So when they were sailing from Germany, they landed on Frederiksdal. So obviously this is where the king, he would have his harbor and this is where he would collect the taxes. This is where the economy is. This is where everything grows from. So this is an important place. We have data from 1300 saying this was actually called Grimstead. Then it was renamed from uh, some, some counts which had vast amount of land on this island. Although I think they owned almost the whole island, Lollen. And then as time goes, you know, it gets split up and gets split up and, and it's just divided in many, many pieces. Besides enormous, what is what is the house like inside? Uh, I should have taken you. Next time you come, I'll show you. Deal. So the style is called Baroque. Well, it's just a big house. Uh, obviously, there are some, you know, nice features with, with what do you call that, plaster in, in the ceilings. Yep. A lot of in French, it's a list of these uh, candle, candeliers. Oh, chandeliers, yeah. yeah. It's just a bit, big house for me. <laughs> <laughs> my job is to keep it up to date, that it doesn't rain in. And uh, that's my national heritage debt, this house, because I actually have to maintain it by law. It's insanely expensive. We have just been so lucky to do a major restoration on the works. We've just finished the 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 roof and the windows and painted it. So now I know I can leave it to my children in a good good state. How did it come into your family? My grandfather, he was an engineer and he got an illness. And the doctor said to him, you can't stay an engineer just sitting at the table. He needed to have fresh air and move. So he became a farmer and he was very innovative and he was actually obsessed with the thought of having one of these big old farms. So he had a small farm, but he was very smart with money. And then he ended up actually selling his small farm and then buying this huge farm. This was in 1957. I always keep thinking of him, how inspiring that was. And today, I I think I owe him a lot. Just, you know, the the last day we painted the manor, we we thought, okay, this is for his sake, we're doing this. And then my father took over the farm and he ran it the way he wanted to run it. My father was very involved in farming politics. The lucky thing was that my father planted a lot of cherry orchards in order to make juice. 
and then he passed it on to you. I inherited the farm from my father in the year 2000. And when I started, I changed a lot of things. And uh, actually behind me, as you can see, uh, we are in a, in a stable. It's a looking parlor, which I built when I was very young. It was really hard work. And we simply couldn't make money on this hard work making milk. So I, I sold all the cows and transferred this building into a winery. I actually merged the farm with five other farmers in a sharing model where our five farms are just being brought together and we just pretend it's one farm. And all the machinery will just go around and working the fields as efficient as they can. And we just share whatever's left in the shares we have put in to this company, which is just equivalent to the, the acreage we have in, in this farm. What's the acreage and what do you grow there? There is about a thousand acres on this farm. 10% of my land is cherry orchards. The other 90% is wheat, barley, sugar beet, grass seed, spinach. So it's more traditional for this area, uh, common uh, crops. But it's just a bulk production and I have no saying in the price. I mean, I just get a lorry and then I get it out of the way. But with the cherries, I have something, you know, I can feel it, I can taste it. And what's really important to me also is that by planting trees, I can do something for the world. If every farmer just put trees on their land, we could, we could save a lot for the world. You're on the island of uh, Lowland, yeah. which is in the Baltic Sea, right? What's that like? The land is very fertile and the climate is quite mild. And when I say mild, I would say it's something like England. England is a little bit warmer than us, but... What's really important for us is that we have sea all around us and the water is quite shallow. And that means that the, the sea is like a heating bank. So the sea is heated up and that makes the winters mild for us. And this is quite important for us because in spring when we have cherry blossom, we just don't need uh, frost because that will spoil the whole harvest. So you needed to make the farm more productive to, among other things, restore the house. So how does the idea of making cherry wine pop into your head? It's not my idea. Really? The big turn in my life was meet the meeting with uh, Jan and Morten, my two partners and co-founders of this company. Jan is a chef. He has a restaurant. And Morten, he's a journalist. And he's written a lot of books about wines in particularly south, south of France. Okay, so how did they come up with the idea? Morten came here by total coincidence one day in 2006. He was doing some research because he was working in a restaurant and he was trying to source local food. And Morton, he said, hey, show me your farm. So we ended up jumping into the car and having the trip around the farm. And then he saw these cherry trees and he said, oh, wow, what's this? And then he, he ate them. And that was at the time when I had cows as well. And I said to him, I can't do this. It's just too expensive having these trees. I don't make money on this. This is a typical farming way of thinking that you just want to rationalize all the time in order to, every time you rationalize, you have more for yourself. That's how farmers survive. He panicked completely. This is something he tells me five years after this coincidence. But he said, why don't we make cherry wine? Well, I liked him a lot. I've just seen him for 30 minutes, but I said, okay, let's do cherry wine. That's it? Yeah. He calls Yen, which is his friend. Yen is a chef and he's a very, very good chef. He was one of the most renowned chefs before, you know, Noma, all this thing. He was educated in the French classic uh, restaurant scene. Maud, he calls up Jan and he says, hey, we want to make cherry wine. Are you into that? And they sort of pulled me into the world of wine. For two years, these two guys, they were just hitting my head and saying, hey, you have to learn what good taste is. I do have a French mother and I've brought up with extremely good food. So... The minute they just started pulling me into this world, and I had a very, very good trip with Morden in 2008, two years after we met. And for three weeks from Spain towards Denmark, we just drank our way through Europe. And I was just tasting all these wonderful wines and, you know, speaking to the farmers. And they were saying terroir here and there, and they could explain skifer stones, uh, boulders, uh, clay soil, and water and wind and all these things they could explain to me uh, and, and I could taste them. I always get the goosebumps telling this because I, that was so fantastic. And 
you know, having had good food and now understanding what wine is and how you made the wine, is that, that's the way I want to become a farmer. What was the one thing you took away from that trip? Winemaking is having a relationship with your soil and you can taste what's going on in the soil because the taste is carried through the berries into the wine. It's just, um, I love that thought. That's great. So what was the next step? I said, okay, Yenon Morden, okay, I want to do this and I want to do this 100%. I started rebuilding this building I'm in now and it became our winery. Slowly we started building up, buying barrels with 50 one year, 20 another year, and, and then got more and more hectoliters in. And at the same time, we started working really hard on how to grow the cherries. And from an economical perspective, it's quite exciting to see what we can do with the winery because on the 10% of cherry fields we have, our turnover is the same as the other 90%. We have a long way to go yet still with the winery before we are full running. Our problem today is telling the world, serving the wine and, and letting them know that this is something they shouldn't miss out on in, in order to have a fun life. The end product, yes, it's cherry wine, but you've kind of invented a whole nother thing. What we're doing hasn't been seen before in the world. I think most people, they would think of liqueurs when you say cherry wine, and it, it's not a liqueur. Yeah. To define the difference between these products is that in a liqueur, you have a juice and you add in an alcohol. So you take a clear spirit like a vodka and you add it in your juice. And you can do that. Kahlua is uh, coffee. Grand is orange. And you have this very famous, it's called either kiafa or cherry herring. My guess is that many bars in the U.S. has still a bottle of cherry herring. And unlike the cherry liqueurs out there, your wine is made with 100% cherry juice. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to put out there that there's nothing else added. We started off by just harvesting our juice. We pressed it. And then we sat down and waited. We did not want to add in yeast. We just want spontaneous fermentation. Very cool. We find that selecting a yeast, we get a very one-dimensional taste. So we, we know we have about five different types of yeast competing in our wine. And uh, you can see just by you know, all the barrels we have here, uh, it's, it's just now it's been infected by our own yeast. So we have a frigid style yeast. And th this is the wild yeast we just have here now. Every year, it just starts off really well. It's not only in the winery, it's also in the orchards, of course. This is really important. Good wine is made in the field. If you went out in the field and did a lot of spraying, you would kill a lot of yeast. We are aware of keeping as many fungicides as possible in the field. And some years, we can actually do it 100% organic. Uh, just because it's very dry, then the cherries are fine. In organic productions, you can just use something uh, as ne baking powder. Uh, do you say baking powder? Yes. Baking powder is, is uh, marvelous for taking off um, uh, fungicides in the field. So this is a way of treating our field. So we, we try and do it as organic as we can. So the taste is, is much better when it's spontaneously fermented. And anybody who has had a Frederick style can taste the uniqueness in this wine because the acidity is really, really outstanding and you have no other product in the world which has the acidity we have what would the acidity be so if you measure the acidity in the wine we have about two three grams in a red wine we have up to 22 20, uh, 25 milligrams of acidity which is uh, very very high it's all about having the the balances between sweetness and acidity and all these flavors you you get from from the the field by harvesting later, we are picking up uh, how to, to deal with this acidity. So this is what we are rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And I will keep doing that to the end of my days. Let's stay out in the field for a second. What type of cherries are you using? It's a sour cherry. There are a lot of different sour cherries because they would just go and pick cherries wild. This is what farmers they do they go and select a tree somewhere in the wood and then they plant it and then they cut a branch and they multiply it and then they get that tree and this is our task so to try and find of all these many species of what, what we find is is the best wine
When do you harvest them? We, we start usually last week of August and then we harvest for the next 10 days. But if, it, if the weather is very good, we will just prolong the season and we will just wait until September, even October sometimes. But that does do require that the weather is very good and the quality of the cherries will maintain good. A few times you've alluded to making the wine in the field, like when you talked about adjusting the acidity by harvesting the cherry later. Can you expand upon the idea? When you make beer, you buy something uh, one day and you mix it and then you have a beer. Whereas we make our wine in the field and then when it comes in the winery, it's a very subtle, subtle thing. So you're saying that unlike in brewing, where you buy your ingredients and play with the recipe to get the beer where you'd like it to be, as a winemaker, you affect the most change in the final product before you get into the winery by doing things to the trees and the fruit. Yeah, when you're a winemaker and you taste your wine, this is the thing, how can I balance the, the grapes so they taste really well? And if I have to make another taste, I would have to do it in the field. When you have a, a grape field, you have a certain amount of square centimeters leaf per bunch. And you regulate the amounts of sugar in the bunch by cutting leaves during the season because the leaf is picking up the sunshine and the, transfers this energy into sugar, which goes into the bunches. And the amount of sugar is equal to the amount of alcohol. As a winemaker, you know where you want your wine to be with a certain ABV in order to have a good flavor. In our case, we want 13, 14 in ABV. So we do a lot of pruning on our trees in order to get the balance. So it's really very unlike the beer where you design your, your, your beer by adding things in. And who's drinking Frederick Stahl? Is it wine drinkers or craft beer fans? Our market is actually more the beer market rather than the wine market because wine people tend to be more conservative. They're a bit reluctant to new tastes. I do feel that the wine world and the beer scene is merging. And I think we are actually sort of a clutch in between because we're a little bit both. Yeah, you're pushing from the wine side while brewers like Jester King, Allagash, and the Lambic producers are pushing from the beer side. But you're right, the craft beer drinkers are a bit more adventurous while the wine drinkers tend to be stuck in their ways. But, but then you have a new type of consumers, uh, which are the, the natural wine scene. And that yeah. fits right into the beer scene. They're quite open to new crazy stuff, you could say. And how's the fine dining sector responded to Frederick Stahl? The gastronomical scene is really embracing us. We sell wine in France in a three-star Michelin restaurant. And, and that's to me, you know, also being French and, and knowing how crazy they are about pairing and understanding food. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a religion. At the same time, we have a new world where, you know, it, it's almost anything new is exciting. But you just have these old, you know, I call it altars or whatever you'd call it. It's, it's yeah, religious people. And it's just foodies who really enjoy. The surely is with a blue cheese, with a French blue cheese, is absolute stunning. Or with some chocolate. In that way, I, I've, I'm very proud of what we do in that sense. That Because I have, you know, you can have a taste and you can nerd into what you do. But having acknowledgement from other people it does is important too. A good chunk of what you do has to be, you know, teaching people what you do. I mean, because I mean, even as I sit here, you know, sit here sipping it, there is sweetness in it, you know, from the cherry, but it's not a sweet drink. I use the word rich for how it tastes more than anything else. And earlier you said unique and truly it is a unique beverage, you know, but how do you go into a restaurant, a bar, uh, a distributor, an importer and get them to embrace this? When I pour a glass the first time to someone, I say, you just have to erase anything in your head you have of any gastronomical sense. You're about to place something you've never had before in your gastronomical mind. And then people drink it. And then they say, okay, this is really nice. But often, very often, the question goes, what should I use it with? Mm -hmm. Because it's the first time they have something. And the minute I say blue cheese, they say, of course, or dark chocolate, or some simmering meats, something like beef bourguignon, 
Yeah, even I think a, a reserve with a very good hamburger is good. You know, it requires something quite heavy, something powerful to go with it. Yeah. Spicy pulled pork. Almost anything that either a port or a creek goes with, it should go, kind of go with. Usually when I say where you would use cranberry, I would use the wine too. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. <laughs> the cranberry is this acidic uh, uh, slice to, to whatever you have. Though we have the acidity, but we also do have a bit of a sweetness. I think the acidic profile to the trees we have in Denmark is is unique. And the old tradition of making liqueurs from Denmark, which has been known throughout the world, is this very uh, heavy, powerful cherry liqueur. And, and uh, this is what we are sort of building on. We are looking, trying to... How can we, yeah, this will be a search to the end of my day, but I would like to have some more ballet into the wine, a little bit more lightness. We're looking very much into the fertilization of the fields. We know that fertilizers, they make things more bitter. So we have to have trees much more in balance with themselves in nature in order to have a good balance between the acidity and the sweetness. How long after planting does it take until the tree is bearing fruit that you can use in the wine? From planting a tree till you have a harvest, it will take you seven years. And then for the first matured wines, we will have to, to wait one, two years. The real matured ones is a ratio is about six, seven years. Everything seems to take some experimenting to dial it in and also quite a bit of time. You know, it's, it's one big trial of, of taste and what they become and time matters, uh, growing season matters and all these things. So um, it's, quite, it's quite fun. Well, now we're looking after the trees much better than the trees we started off with because they were just meant for juice production. And yeah, my father wasn't aware of what a tree could be because he didn't think in terms like a wine producer. So because you can have grapes being 100 years old or even 200 years old. But we try and, and keep the trees and treat them as well as possible in order to have them for a really long time. Also because the complexity in the wine increases uh, with, with the years. As the roots get deeper into the ground, they will have more mineralic flavors instead of just topsoil. And just out of curiosity, how long is a bottle of your wine good for? You can keep it forever. It will be like Madeira, a port wine or sherry. So it has a really long perspective. And having all this, um, especially this time frame to look into and what different taste it gets and gives you is really exciting. And from a business perspective, it's not a IT factory where you just press a button and you have spread your, your goods in the whole world just by the press of a button. You can't do that. Please join me next time for part two of my interview with Harold. We'll be discussing how Frederickstahl produces the different varieties of their cherry wine and how they're faring during the pandemic. And for more info on Frederickstahl or to order some of their wine, you can check out their website. The link's in the video's description. And if you like this episode or any of the others you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.